Chapter 36, Part 3 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Without the help of a personal interview, Genseric was sufficiently acquainted with the genius and designs of his adversary. He practiced his customary arts of fraud and delay, but he practiced them without success. His applications for peace became each hour more submissive and perhaps more sincere. But the inflexible Majorian had adopted the ancient maxim that Rome could not be safe as long as Carthage existed in a hostile state. The king of the Vandals distrusted the valor of his native subjects, who were enervated by the luxury of the south. He suspected the fidelity of the vanquished people, who abhorred him as an Arian tyrant, and the desperate measures which he executed by reducing Mauritania into a desert could not defeat the operations of the Roman emperor, who was at liberty to land his troops on any part of the African coast. But Genseric was saved from impending and inevitable ruin by the treachery of some powerful subjects, envious or apprehensive of their master's success. Guided by their secret intelligence, he surprised the unguarded fleet in the Bay of Carthagena. Many of the ships were sunk or taken or burnt, and the preparations of three years were destroyed in a single day. After this event, the behavior of the two antagonists showed them superior to their fortune. The vandal, instead of being elated by this accidental victory, immediately renewed his solicitations for peace. The emperor of the West, who was capable of forming great designs and supporting heavy disappointments, consented to a treaty, or rather to a suspension of arms, in the full assurance that before he could restore his navy, he should be supplied with provocations to justify a second war. Majorian returned to Italy to prosecute his labors for the public happiness, and as he was conscious of his own integrity, he might long remain ignorant of the dark conspiracy which threatened his throne and his life. The recent misfortune of Carthagena sullied the glory which had dazzled the eyes of the multitude. Almost every description of civil and military officers were exasperated against the reformer, since they had all derived some advantage from the abuses which he endeavored to suppress. And the patrician Ricimer impelled the inconstant passions of the barbarians against a prince whom he esteemed and hated. The virtues of Majorian could not protect him from the impetuous sedition which broke out in the camp near Tortona, at the foot of the Alps. He was compelled to abdicate the imperial purple. Five days after his abdication, it was reported that he died of a dysentery, and the humble tomb which covered his remains was consecrated by the respect and gratitude of succeeding generations. The private character of Majorian inspired love and respect. Malicious calumny and satire excited his indignation, or, if he himself were the object, his contempt. But he protected the freedom of wit, and in the hours which the emperor gave to the familiar society of his friends, he could indulge his taste for pleasantry, without degrading the majesty of his rank. It was not, perhaps, with some regret that Ricimer sacrificed his friend to the interest of his ambition, but he resolved in a second choice to avoid the imprudent preference of superior virtue and merit. At his command, the obsequious senate of Rome bestowed the imperial title on Libius Severus, who ascended the throne of the West without emerging from the obscurity of a private condition. History has scarcely deigned to notice his birth, his elevation, his character, or his death. Severus expired as soon as his life became inconvenient to his patron, and it would be useless to discriminate his nominal reign in the vacant interval of six years between the death of Majorian and the elevation of Anthemius. During that period, the government was in the hands of Ricimer alone, and although the modest barbarian disclaimed the name of a king, he accumulated treasures, formed a separate army, negotiated private alliances, and ruled Italy with the same independent and despotic authority which was afterwards exercised by Odoacer and Theodoric. But his dominions were bounded by the Alps, and two Roman generals, Marcellinus and Aegidius, maintained their alliance to the Republic by rejecting with disdain the phantom which he styled an emperor. Marcellinus still adhered to the old religion, and the devout pagans, who secretly disobeyed the laws of the church and state, applauded his profound skill in the science of divination. But he possessed the more valuable qualifications of learning, virtue, and courage. The study of the Latin literature had improved his taste, 
and his military talents had recommended him to the esteem and confidence of the great Aetius, in whose ruin he was involved. By a timely flight, Marcellinus escaped the rage of Valentinian, and boldly asserted his liberty amidst the convulsions of the Western Empire. His voluntary or reluctant submission to the authority of Majorian was rewarded by the government of Sicily, and the command of an army stationed in that island to oppose or attack the Vandals. But his barbarian mercenaries, after the emperor's death, were tempted to revolt by the artful liberality of Ricimer. At the head of a band of faithful followers, the intrepid Marcellinus occupied the province of Dalmatia, assumed the title of Patrician of the West, secured the love of his subjects by a mild and equitable reign, built a fleet which claimed the domination of the Hadriatic, and alternately alarmed the coasts of Italy and Africa. Aegidius, the master general of Gaul, who equaled, or at least who imitated, the heroes of ancient Rome, proclaimed his immortal resentment against the assassins of his beloved master. A brave and numerous army was attached to his standard, and though he was prevented by the arts of Ricimer and the arms of the Visigoths from marching to the gates of Rome, he maintained his independent sovereignty beyond the Alps, and rendered the name of Aegidius respectable both in peace and war. The Franks, who had punished with exile the youthful follies of Childeric, elected the Roman general for their king. His vanity rather than his ambition was gratified by that singular honor, and when the nation, at the end of four years, repented of the injury which they had offered to the Merovingian family, he patiently acquiesced in the restoration of the lawful prince. The authority of Aegidius ended only with his life, and the suspicions of poison and secret violence, which derived some countenance from the character of Ricimer, were eagerly entertained by the passionate credulity of the Gauls. The kingdom of Italy, a name to which the Western Empire was gradually reduced, was afflicted under the reign of Ricimer by the incessant depredations of Vandal pirates. In the spring of each year they equipped a formidable navy in the port of Carthage, and Genseric himself, though in a very advanced age, still commanded in person the most important expeditions. His designs were concealed with impenetrable secrecy till the moment that he hoisted sail. When he was asked by the pilot what course he should steer, Leave the determination to the winds, replied the barbarian with pious arrogance. They will transport us to the guilty coast on whose inhabitants have provoked the divine justice. But if Genseric himself deigned to issue more precise orders, he judged the most wealthy to be the most criminal. The Vandals repeatedly visited the coasts of Spain, Liguria, Tuscany, Campania, Lucania, Brutium, Apulia, Calabria, Venetia, Dalmatia, Epirus, Greece, and Sicily. They were tempted to subdue the island of Sardinia, so advantageously placed in the center of the Mediterranean, and their arms spread desolation or terror from the columns of Hercules to the mouth of the Nile. As they were more ambitious of spoil than of glory, they seldom attacked any fortified cities, or engaged any regular troops in an open field. But the celerity of their motions enabled them almost at the same time to threaten and to attack the most distant objects which attracted their desires, and as soon as they had embarked a sufficient number of horses, they no sooner landed than they swept the dismayed country with a body of light cavalry. Yet, notwithstanding the example of their king, the native Vandals and Alani insensibly declined this toilsome and perilous warfare. The hardy generation of the first conquerors was almost extinguished, and their sons, who were born in Africa, enjoyed the delicious baths and gardens which had been acquired by the valor of their fathers. Their place was readily supplied by a various multitude of Moors and Romans, of captives and outlaws, and those desperate wretches, who had already violated the laws of their country, were the most eager to promote the atrocious acts which disgraced the victories of Genseric. In the treatment of his unhappy prisoners, he sometimes consulted his avarice, and sometimes indulged his cruelty, and the massacre of five hundred noble citizens of Zante, or Zaxinthus, whose mangled bodies he cast into the Ionian Sea, was imputed by the public indignation to his latest posterity. Such crimes will not be excused by any provocations, but the war which the king of the Vandals prosecuted against the Roman Empire was justified by a specious and reasonable motive. The widow of Valentinian, Eudoxia, 
whom he had led captive from Rome to Carthage, was the sole heiress of the Theodosian house. Her eldest daughter, Eudocia, became the reluctant wife of Huneric, his eldest son, and the stern father asserted a legal claim which could not be easily refuted or satisfied, demanded a just proportion of the imperial patrimony. An adequate, or at least a valuable compensation, was offered by the eastern emperor to purchase a necessary peace. Eudocia and her younger daughter, Placidia, were honorably restored, and the fury of the Vandals was confined to the limits of the western empire. The Italians, destitute of a naval force, which alone was capable of protecting their coasts, implored the aid of the more fortunate nations of the East, who had formerly acknowledged in peace and war the supremacy of Rome. But the perpetual division of two empires had alienated their interest and their inclinations. The faith of a recent treaty was alleged, and the western Romans, instead of arms and ships, could only obtain the assistance of a cold and ineffectual mediation. The haughty Ricimer, who had long struggled with the difficulties of his situation, was at length reduced to address the throne of Constantinople in a humble language of a subject, and Italy submitted, as the price and security of the alliance, to accept a master from the choice of the emperor of the East. It is not the purpose of the present chapter, or even of the present volume, to continue the distinct series of the Byzantine history, but a concise view of the reign and character of the emperor Leo may explain the last efforts that were attempted to save the falling empire of the West. Since the death of the younger Theodosius, the domestic repose of Constantinople had never been interrupted by war or faction. Pulcheria had bestowed her hand and the scepter of the East on the modest virtue of Marcion. He gratefully reverenced her august rank and virgin chastity, and after her death he gave his people the example of the religious worship that was due to the memory of the imperial saint. Attentive to the prosperity of his own dominions, Marcion seemed to behold with indifference the misfortunes of Rome, and the obstinate refusal of a brave and active prince to draw his sword against the Vandals was ascribed to a secret promise which had formerly been exacted from him when he was a captive in the power of Genseric. The death of Marcion, after a reign of seven years, would have exposed the East to the danger of a popular election, if the superior weight of a single family had not been able to incline the balance in favor of a candidate whose interests they supported. The patrician Aspar might have placed the diadem on his own head, if he would have submitted to the Nicene Creed. During three generations the armies of the East were successfully commanded by his father, himself, and by his son, Ardaborius. His barbarian guards formed a military force that overawed the palace and the capital, and the liberal distribution of his immense treasures rendered Aspar as popular as he was powerful. He recommended the obscure name of Leo of Thrace, a military tribune, and the principal steward of his household. His nomination was unanimously ratified by the Senate, and the servant of Aspar received the imperial crown from the hands of the patriarch or bishop, who was permitted to express, by this unusual ceremony, the suffrage of the deity. This emperor, the first of the name of Leo, has been distinguished by the title of the Great, from a succession of princes who gradually fixed in the opinion of the Greeks a very humble standard of heroic, or at least of royal, perfection. Yet the temperate firmness with which Leo resisted the oppression of his benefactor showed that he was conscious of his duty and of his prerogative. Aspar was astounded to find that his influence could no longer appoint a prefect of Constantinople. He presumed to reproach his sovereign with a breach of promise, and insolently shaking his purple. It is not proper, said he, that the man who is invested with this garment should be guilty of lying. Nor is it proper, replied Leo, that a prince should be compelled to resign his own judgment and the public interest to the will of his subject. After this extraordinary scene, it was impossible that the reconciliation of the emperor and the patrician could be sincere, or at least that it could be solid and permanent. An army of Isaurians was secretly levied and introduced into Constantinople, and while Leo undermined the authority and prepared the disgrace of the family of Aspar, his mild and cautious behavior restrained them from any rash and desperate attempts, which might have been fatal to themselves or to their enemies and the measures of peace and war were effected by this internal revolution. As long as Aspar degraded the majesty of the throne, the secret correspondence of religion and interest engaged him to favor the cause of Genseric. 
When Leo had delivered himself from that ignominious servitude, he listened to the complaints of the Italians, resolved to extirpate the tyranny of the Vandals, and declared his alliance with his colleague Anthemius, whom he solemnly invested with the diadem and purple of the West. The virtues of Anthemius have perhaps been magnified, since the imperial descent, which he could only deduce from the usurper Procopius, has been swelled into a line of emperors. But the merit of his immediate parents, their honors, and their riches, rendered Athemius as one of the most illustrious subjects of the East. His father, Procopius, obtained, after his Persian embassy, the rank of general and patrician, and the name of Anthemius was derived from his maternal grandfather, the celebrated prefect who protected, with so much ability and success, the infant reign of Theodosius. The grandson of the prefect was raised above the condition of a private subject by his marriage with Euphemia, the daughter of the emperor Marcion. This splendid alliance, which might supersede the necessity of merit, hastened the promotion of Anthemius to the successive dignities of count, of master general, of consul, and of patrician. And his merit, or his fortune, claimed the honors of a victory which was obtained on the banks of the Danube over the Huns. Without indulging in extravagant ambition, the son-in-law of Marcion might hope to be a successor, but Anthemius supported the disappointment with courage and patience, and his subsequent elevation was universally approved by the public who esteemed him worthy to reign till he ascended the throne. The emperor of the West marched from Constantinople, attended by several counts of high distinction, and a body of guards almost equal to the strength and numbers of a regular army. He entered Rome in triumph, and the choice of Leo was confirmed by the Senate, the people, and the barbarian confederates of Italy. The solemn inauguration of Anthemius was followed by the nuptials of his daughter and the patrician Ricimer, a fortunate event which was considered as the firmest security of the union and happiness of the state. The wealth of two empires was ostentatiously displayed, and many senators completed their ruin by an expensive effort to disguise their poverty. All serious business was suspended during this festival. The courts of justice were shut. The streets of Rome, the theaters, the places of public and private resort resounded with hymeneal songs and dances, and the royal bride, clothed in silken robes, with a crown on her head, was conducted to the palace of Ricimer, who had changed his military dress for the habit of a consul and a senator. On this memorable occasion, Sidonius, whose early ambition had been so fatally blasted, appeared as the orator of Auvergne amidst the provincial deputies who addressed the throne with congratulations or complaints. The calends of January were now approaching, and the venal poet, who had loved Avitus and esteemed Majorian, was persuaded by his friends to celebrate, in heroic verse, the merit, the felicity, the second consulship, and the future triumphs of the emperor Anthemius. Sidonius pronounced, with assurance and success, a panegyric which is still extant, and whatever might be the imperfections, either of the subject or of the composition, the welcome flatterer was immediately rewarded with the prefecture of Rome, a dignity which placed him among the illustrious personages of the empire, till he wisely preferred the more respectable character of a bishop and a saint. The Greeks ambitiously commend the piety and Catholic faith of the emperor whom they gave to the West, nor do they forget to observe that, when he left Constantinople, he converted his palace into a pious foundation of a public bath, a church, and a hospital for old men. Yet some suspicious appearances are found to sully the theological fame of Anthemius. From the conversation of Philotheus, a Macedonian sectary, he had imbibed the spirit of religious toleration, and the heretics of Rome would have assembled with impunity if the bold and vehement censure which Pope Hilary pronounced in the Church of St. Peter had not obliged him to abjure the unpopular indulgence. Even the pagans, a feeble and obscure remnant, conceived some vain hopes from the indifference or partiality of Anthemius, and his singular friendship for the philosopher Severus, whom he promoted to the consulship, was ascribed to a secret project of reviving the ancient worship of the gods. These idols were crumbled in the dust, and the mythology which had once been the creed of nations was so universally disbelieved that it might be employed without scandal, or at least without suspicion, by Christian poets. Yet, the vestiges of superstition were not absolutely obliterated, and the festival of the Lupercalia, 
whose origin had preceded the foundation of Rome, was still celebrated under the reign of Anthemius. The savage and simple rites were expressive of an early state of society, before the invention of arts and agriculture. The rustic deities who presided over the toils and pleasures of the pastoral life, Pan, Faunus, and their train of satyrs, were such as the fancy of shepherds might create, sportive, petulant, and lascivious, whose power was limited, and whose malice was inoffensive. A goat was the offering best adapted to their character and attributes. The flesh of the victim was roasted on willow spits, and the riotous youths who crowded to the feast ran naked about the fields, with leather thongs in their hands, communicating, as it was supposed, the blessing of fecundity to the women whom they touched. The altar of Pan was erected, perhaps by Evander the Arcadian, in the dark recess in the side of the Palatine Hill watered by a perpetual fountain and shaded by a hanging grove a tradition that in the same place romulus and remus were suckled by the wolf rendered it still more sacred and venerable in the eyes of the romans and this sylvan spot was gradually surrounded by the stately edifices of the forum after the conversion of the imperial city the christians still continued in the month of february the annual celebration of the lupercalia to which they ascribed a secret and mysterious influence on the genial powers of the animal and vegetable world. The bishops of Rome were solicitous to abolish a profane custom, so repugnant to the spirit of Christianity. But their zeal was not supported by the authority of the civil magistrate. The inveterate abuse subsisted till the end of the fifth century, and the Pope Galatius, who purified the capital from the last stain of idolatry, appeased, by a formal apology, the murmurs of the Senate and people. End of chapter 36, part 3. Chapter 36, part 4 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In all his public declarations, the Emperor Leo assumes the authority and professes the affection of a father for his son, Anthemius, with whom he had divided the administration of the universe. The situation, and perhaps the character of Leo, dissuaded him from exposing his person to the toils and dangers of an African war. But the powers of the Eastern Empire were strenuously exerted to deliver Italy and the Mediterranean from the Vandals, and Genseric, who had so long oppressed both the land and sea, was threatened from every side with a formidable invasion. The campaign was opened by a bold and successful enterprise by the prefect Heraclius. The troops of Egypt, Thebius, and Libya were embarked under his command, and the Arabs, with a train of horses and camels, opened the roads of the desert. Heraclius landed on the coast of Tripoli, surprised and subdued the cities of that province, and prepared, by a laborious march, which Cato had formerly executed, to join the imperial army under the walls of Carthage. The intelligence of this loss extorted from Genseric some insidious and ineffectual propositions of peace, but he was still more seriously alarmed by the reconciliation of Marcellinus with the two empires. The independent patrician had been persuaded to acknowledge the legitimate title of Anthemius, whom he accompanied in his journey to Rome. The Dalmatian fleet was received into the harbors of Italy, the active valor of Marcellinus expelled the Vandals from the island of Sardinia, and the languid efforts of the West added some weight to the immense preparations of the Eastern Romans. The expense of the naval armament which Leo sent against the Vandals has been distinctly ascertained, and the curious and instructive account displays the wealth of the declining empire. The royal demesnes, or private patrimony of the prince, supplied 17,000 pounds of gold. 47,000 pounds of gold and 700,000 of silver were levied and paid into the treasury by the Praetorian prefects, but the cities were reduced to extreme poverty, and the diligent calculation of fines and forfeitures, as a valuable object of the revenue, does not suggest the idea of a just or merciful administration. The whole expense, by whatsoever means it was defrayed, of the African campaign amounted to the sum of 130,000 pounds of gold about five millions two hundred thousand pounds sterling, 
at a time when the value of money appears from the comparative price of corn to have been somewhat higher than in the present age. The fleet that sailed from Constantinople to Carthage consisted of 1,113 ships, and the number of soldiers and marines exceeded 100,000 men. Basiliscus, the brother of the Empress Verina, was entrusted with this important command. His sister, the wife of Leo, had exaggerated the merit of his former exploits against the Scythians, but the discovery of his guilt or incapacity was reserved for the African war, and his friends could only save his military reputation by asserting that he had conspired with Aspar to spare Genseric and to betray the last hope of the Western Empire. Experience has shown that success of an invader most commonly depends on the vigor and celerity of his operations. The strength and sharpness of the first impressions are blunted by delay. The health and spirit of the troops are insensibly languished on a, in a distant climate. The naval and military force, a mighty effort which perhaps can never be repeated, is silently consumed, and every hour which is wasted in negotiation accustoms the enemy to contemplate and examine those hostile terrors which, on their first appearance, he deemed irresistible. The formidable navy of Basiliscus pursued its prosperous navigation from the Thracian Bosphorus to the coasts of Africa. He landed his troops at Cape Bona, or the Promontory of Mercury, about forty miles from Carthage. The army of Heraclius and the fleet of Marcellinus either joined or seconded the imperial lieutenant, and the Vandals who opposed his progress by sea or by land were successively vanquished. If Basiliscus had seized the moment of consternation and boldly advanced to the capital, Carthage must have surrendered, and the kingdom of the Vandals was extinguished. Genseric beheld the danger with firmness, and eluded it with his veteran dexterity. He protested, in the most respectful language, that he was ready to submit his person and his dominions to the will of the emperor. But he requested a truce of five days to regulate the terms of his submission, and it was universally believed that his secret liberality contributed to the success of this public negotiation. Instead of obstinately refusing whatever indulgence his enemy so earnestly solicited, the guilty or the credulous Basiliscus consented to the fatal truce, and his imprudent security seemed to proclaim that he already considered himself as the conqueror of Africa. During this short interval the wind became favorable to the designs of Genseric. He manned his largest ships of war with the bravest of moors and vandals, and they towed after many of them many barks filled with combustible materials. In the obscurity of the night, these destructive vessels were impelled against the unguarded and unsuspecting fleet of the Romans, who were awakened by the sense of their instant danger. Their close and crowded order assisted the progress of the fire, which was communicated with rapid and irresistible violence, and the noise of the wind, the crackling of the flames, and the dissonant cries of the soldiers and mariners, who could neither command nor obey, increased the horror of the nocturnal tumult. Whilst they labored to extricate themselves from the fire ships and to save at least a part of the navy, the galleys of Genseric assaulted them with temperate and disciplined valor, and many of the Romans, who had escaped the fury of the flames, were destroyed or taken by the victorious vandals. Among the events of that disastrous night, the heroic, or rather desperate, courage of John, one of the principal officers of Basiliscus, has rescued his name from oblivion. When the ship which he had bravely defended was almost consumed, he threw himself in his armor into the sea, disdainfully rejected the esteem and pity of Genso, the son of Genseric, who pressed him to accept honorable quarter, and sunk under the waves, exclaiming, with his last breath, that he would never fall alive into the hands of those impious dogs. Actuated by a far different spirit, Basiliscus, whose station was the most remote from danger, disgracefully fled in the beginning of the engagement, returned to Constantinople with the loss of more than half of his fleet and army, and sheltered his guilty head in the sanctuary of St. Sophia, till his sister, by her tears and entreaties, could obtain his pardon from the indignant emperor. Heraclius effected his retreat through the desert. Marcellinus returned to Sicily, where he was assassinated, perhaps at the instigation of Ricimer, by one of his own captains, and the king of the Vandals expressed his surprise and satisfaction that the Romans themselves should remove from the world his most formidable antagonists. After the failure of this great expedition, Genseric again became the tyrant of the sea. The coasts of Italy, 
Greece, and Asia were again exposed to his revenge and avarice. Tripoli and Sardinia returned to his obedience, and he added Sicily to the number of his provinces, and before he died, in the fullness of years and of glory, he beheld the final extinction of the empire of the West. During his long and active reign, the African monarch had studiously cultivated the friendship of the barbarians of Europe, whose arms he might employ in a seasonable and effectual diversion against the two empires. After the death of Attila, he renewed his alliance with the Visigoths of Gaul, and the sons of the elder Theodoric, who successfully reigned over that warlike nation, were easily persuaded by the sense of interest to forget the cruel affront which Genseric had inflicted on their sister. The death of the emperor Majorian delivered Theodoric II from the restraint of fear, and perhaps of honor. He violated his recent treaty with the Romans, and the ample territory of Narbonne, which he firmly united to his dominions, became the immediate reward of his perfidy. The selfish policy of Ricimer encouraged him to invade the provinces, which were in the possession of Aegidius, his rival. But the active count, by the defense of Arles and the victory of Orléans, saved Gaul, and checked during his lifetime the progress of the Visigoths. Their ambition was soon rekindled, and the design of extinguishing the Roman Empire in Spain and Gaul was conceived and almost completed in the reign of Euric, who assassinated his brother Theodoric, and displayed, in a more savage temper, superior abilities both in peace and war. He passed the Pyrenees at the head of a numerous army, subdued the cities of Saragossa and Pampeluna, vanquished in battle the martial nobles of the Tarragonese province, carried his victorious arms into the heart of Lusitania, and permitted the Suevi to hold the kingdom of Galicia under the Gothic monarchy of Spain. The efforts of Euric were not less vigorous or successful in Gaul, and throughout the country that extends from the Pyrenees to the Rhone and the Loire, Berry and Avignon were the only cities or dioceses which refused to acknowledge him as their master. In the defense of Clermont, their principal town, the inhabitants of Auvergne, sustained with inflexible resolution the miseries of war, pestilence, and famine, and the Visigoths, relinquishing the fruitless siege, suspended the hopes of that important conquest. The youth of the province were animated by the heroic and almost incredible youth of Aedictius, the son of the emperor Avitus, who made a desperate sally with only eighteen horsemen, boldly attacked the Gothic army, and after maintaining a flying skirmish, retired safe and victorious within the walls of Clermont. His charity was equal to his courage. In a time of extreme scarcity, four thousand poor were fed at his expense, and his private influence levied an army of Burgundians for the deliverance of Auvergne. From his victories alone, the faithful citizens of Gaul derived any hope of safety or freedom, and even such virtues were insufficient to avert the impending ruin of their country since they were anxious to learn, from his authority and example, whether they should prefer the alternative of exile or servitude. The public confidence was lost, and the resources of the state were exhausted, and the Gauls had too much reason to believe that Anthemius, who resigned in Italy, was incapable of protecting his distressed subjects beyond the Alps. The feeble emperor could only procure for their defense the service of twelve thousand British auxiliaries. Real Themis, one of the independent kings or chieftains of the island, was persuaded to transport his troops to the continent of Gaul. He sailed up the Loire and established his quarters in Berry, where the people complained of these oppressive allies till they were destroyed or dispersed by the arms of the Visigoths. One of the last acts of jurisdiction which the Roman Senate exercised over their subjects of Gaul was the trial and condemnation of Avandus, the praetorian prefect. Sidonius, who rejoices that he lived under a reign in which he might pity and assist a state criminal, has expressed with tenderness and freedom the faults of his indiscreet and unfortunate friend. From the perils which he had escaped, Arvandus imbibed confidence rather than wisdom, and such was the various though uniform imprudence of his behavior, that his prosperity must appear much more surprising than his downfall. The second prefecture, which he obtained within a term of five years, abolished the merit and popularity of his preceding administration. His easy temper was corrupted by flattery and exasperated by opposition. He was forced to satisfy his importunate creditors with the spoils of the province. His capricious insolence offended the nobles of Gaul, 
and he sunk under the weight of the public hatred. The mandate of his disgrace summoned him to justify his conduct before the Senate, and he passed the Sea of Tuscany with a favorable wind, the presage, as he vainly imagined, of his future fortunes. A decent respect was still observed for the praetorian rank, and on his arrival at Rome, Arvandus was committed to the hospitality, rather than to the custody, of Flavius Asellus, the count of the sacred largesse, who resided in the capital. He was eagerly pursued by his accusers, the four deputies of Gaul, who were all distinguished by their birth, their dignities, or their eloquence. In the name of a great province, and according to the forms of Roman jurisprudence, they instituted a civil and criminal action, requiring such restitution as might compensate the losses of individuals, and such punishments as might satisfy the justice of the state. Their charges of corrupt oppression were numerous and weighty, but they placed their secret dependence on a letter which they had intercepted, and which they could prove, by the evidence of a secretary, to have been dictated by Arvandus himself. The author of this letter seemed to dissuade the king of the Goths from a peace with the Greek emperor. He suggested the attack of the Britons on the Loire, and he recommended a division of Gaul according to the law of nations between the Visigoths and the Burgundians. These pernicious schemes, which a friend could only palliate by the reproaches of vanity and indiscretion, were susceptible of a treasonable interpretation, and the deputies had artly resolved not to produce their most formidable weapons till the decisive moment of the conquest. But their intentions were discovered by the zeal of Sidonius. He immediately apprised the unsuspecting criminal of his danger, and sincerely lamented, without any mixture of anger, the haughty presumption of Arvandus, who rejected and even resented the salutary advice of his friends. Ignorant of his real situation, Arvandus showed himself in the capital in the white robe of a candidate, accepted indiscriminate salutations and offers of service, examined the shops of the merchants, the silks and gems, sometimes with the indifference of a spectator, and sometimes with the intention of a purchaser, and complained of the times, of the senate, and of the prince, and of the delays of justice. His complaints were soon removed. An early day was fixed for his trial, and Arvandus appeared with his accusers before a numerous assembly of the Roman Senate. The mournful garb which they affected excited the compassion of the judges, and they were scandalized by the gay and splendid dress of their adversary. And when the prefect Arvandus, with the first of the Gallic deputies, was directed to take their places on the senatorial benches, the same contrast of pride and modesty was observed in their behavior. In this memorable judgment, which presented a lively image of the old republic, the Gauls exposed, with force and freedom, the grievances of the province, and as soon as the minds of the audience were sufficiently inflamed, they recited the fatal epistle. The obstinacy of Arvandus was founded on the strange supposition that a subject could not be convicted of treason unless he had actually conspired to assume the purple. As the paper was read, he repeatedly, and with a loud voice, acknowledged it for his genuine composition, and his astonishment was equal to his dismay when the unanimous voice of the Senate declared him guilty of a capital offense. By their decree, he was degraded from the rank of a prefect to the obscure condition of a plebeian, and ignominiously dragged by servile hands to the public prison. After a fortnight's adjournment, the Senate was again convened to pronounce the sentence of his death. But while he expected, in the island of Aesculapius, the expiration of the thirty days allowed by an ancient law to the vilest malefactors, his friends interposed, the emperor Anthemius relented, and the prefect of Gaul obtained the milder punishment of exile and confiscation. The faults of Arvandus might deserve compassion, but the impunity of Serenitus accused the justice of the republic till he was condemned and executed on the complaint of the people of Auvergne. That flagitious minister, the Catiline of his age and country, held a secret correspondence with the Visigoths to betray the province which he had oppressed. His industry was continually exercised by the discovery of new taxes and obsolete offenses, and his extravagant vices would have inspired contempt if they had not excited fear and abhorrence. Such criminals were not beyond the reach of justice, but whatever might be the fault of Ricimer, that powerful barbarian was able to contend, or to negotiate with the prince whose alliance he had condescended to accept. 
The peaceful and prosperous reign which Anthemius had promised to the West was soon clouded by misfortune and discord. Ricimer, apprehensive or impatient of a superior, retired from Rome and fixed his residence at Milan, an advantageous situation, either to invite or to repel the warlike tribes which were seated beyond the Alps and the Danube. Italy was gradually divided between two independent and hostile kingdoms, and the nobles of Liguria, who trembled at the near approach of a civil war, fell prostrate to the feet of the patrician, and conjured him to spare their unhappy country. For my own part, replied Ricimer, in a tone of insolent moderation, I am still inclined to embrace the friendship of the Galatian. But who will undertake to appease his anger, or to mitigate the pride which always rises in proportion to our submission? They informed him that Epiphanius, bishop of Pavia, united the wisdom of the serpent with the innocence of the dove, and appeared confident that the eloquence of such an ambassador might prevail against the strongest opposition, either of interest or passion. The recommendation was improved, and Epiphanius, assuming the benevolent office of mediation, proceeded without delay to Rome, where he was received with the honors due to his merit and reputation. The oration of a bishop in favor of peace might be easily supposed. He argued that, in all possible circumstances, the forgiveness of injuries must be an act of mercy, or magnanimity, or prudence, and he seriously admonished the emperor to avoid a contest with a fierce barbarian, which might be fatal to himself, and must be ruinous to his dominions. Anthemius acknowledged the truth of his maxims, but he deeply felt, with grief and indignation, the behavior of Ricimer, and his passion gave eloquence and energy to his discourse. What favors, he warmly exclaimed, have we refused to this ungrateful man? What provocations have we not endured? Regardless of the majesty of the purple, I gave my daughter to a goth. I sacrificed my own blood to the safety of the republic. The liberality which ought to have secured the internal attachment of Ricimer has exasperated him against his benefactor. What wars has he not excited against the empire? How often has he instigated and assisted the fury of hostile nations? Shall I now accept his perfidious friendship? Can I hope that he will respect the engagements of a treaty, who has already violated the duties of a son? But the anger of Anthemius evaporated in these passionate exclamations he insensibly yielded to the proposals of Epiphanius, and the bishop returned to his diocese with the satisfaction of restoring the peace of Italy by a reconciliation of which the sincerity and continuance might be reasonably suspected. The clemency of the emperor was extorted from his weakness, and Ricimer suspended his ambitious designs till he had secretly prepared the engines with which he resolved to subvert the throne of Anthemius. The mask of peace and moderation was then thrown aside, the army of Ricimer was fortified by a numerous reinforcement of Burgundians and Oriental Suevi. He disclaimed all allegiance to the Greek emperor, marched from Milan to the gates of Rome, and, fixing his camp on the banks of the Anio, impatiently expected the arrival of Olibrius, his imperial candidate. The senator Olibrius of the Ancian family might esteem himself the lawful heir of the Western Empire. He had married Placidia, the younger daughter of Valentinian, after she was restored by Genseric, who still detained her sister Eudocia as the wife, or rather as the captive, of his son. The king of the Vandals supported, by threats and solicitations, the fair pretensions of his Roman ally, and assigned, as one of the motives of the war, the refusal of the senate and people to acknowledge their lawful prince, and the unworthy preference which they had given to a stranger. The friendship of the public enemy might render Olibrius still more unpopular to the Italians, but when Ricimer mediated the ruin of the emperor Anthemius, he tempted, with the offer of a diadem, the candidate who could justify his rebellion by an illustrious name and a royal alliance. The husband of Placidia, who, like most of his ancestors, had been invested with the consular dignity, might have continued to enjoy a secure and a splendid fortune in the peaceful residence of Constantinople nor does he appear to have been tormented by such a genius as cannot be amused or occupied unless by the administration of an empire. Yet Olibrius yielded to the importunities of his friends, perhaps of his wife, rashly plunged into the dangers and calamities of a civil war, and with the secret connivance of the Emperor Leo, accepted the Italian purple, which was bestowed and resumed at the capricious will of a barbarian. 
he landed without obstacle, for Genseric was the master of the sea, either at Ravenna or the port of Ostia, and immediately proceeded to the camp of Ricimer, where he was received as the sovereign of the western world. The patrician, who had extended his posts from the Anio to the Milvian Bridge, already possessed two quarters of Rome, the Vatican, and the Janiculum, which are separated by the Tiber from the rest of the city, and it may be conjectured that an assembly of seceding senators imitated, in the choice of Olibrius, the forms of a legal election. But the body of the Senate and people firmly adhered to the cause of Anthemius, and the more effectual support of a Gothic army enabled him to prolong his reign and the public distress by a resistance of three months, which produced the concomitant evils of famine and pestilence. At length Ricimer made a furious assault on the bridge of Hadrian, or Sant Angelo, and the narrow pass was defended with equal valor by the Goths, till the death of Gilimir, their leader. The victorious troops, breaking down every barrier, rushed with irresistible violence into the heart of the city, and Rome, if we may use the language of a contemporary pope, was subverted by the civil fury of Anthemius and Ricimer. The unfortunate Anthemius was dragged from his concealment and inhumanly massacred by the command of his son-in-law, who thus added a third, or perhaps a fourth, emperor to the number of his victims. The soldiers who united the rage of factious citizens with the savage manners of barbarians were indulged without control in the license of rapine and murder. The crowd of slaves and plebeians, who were unconcerned in the event, could only gain by the indiscriminate pillage, and the face of the city exhibited the strange contrast of stern cruelty and dissolute intemperance. Forty days after this calamitous event, the subject not of glory but of guilt, Italy was delivered by a painful disease, from the tyrant Ricimer, who bequeathed the command of his army to his nephew, Gundobald, one of the princes of the Burgundians. In the same year, all the principal actors in this great revolution were removed from the stage, and the whole reign of Olibrius, whose death does not betray any symptoms of violence, is included within the term of seven months. He left one daughter, the offspring of his marriage with Placidia, and the family of the great Theodosius, transplanted from Spain to Constantinople, was propagated in the female line as far as the eighth generation. End of chapter 36, part 4「Thirty Six, Part Five of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Whilst the vacant throne of Italy was abandoned to lawless barbarians, the election of a new colleague was seriously agitated in the Council of Leo. The Empress Verina, studious to promote the greatness of her own family, had married one of her nieces to Julius Nepos, who succeeded his uncle Marcellinus in the sovereignty of Dalmatia, a more solid possession than the title which he was persuaded to accept of Emperor of the West. But the measures of the Byzantine court were so languid and irresolute that many months elapsed after the death of Anthemius, and even of Olibrius, before their destined successor can show himself with a respectable force to his Italian subjects. During that interval, Glycarius, an obscure soldier, was invested with the purple by his patron Gundobald, but the Burgundian prince was unable or unwilling to support his nomination by a civil war. The pursuits of domestic ambition recalled him beyond the Alps, and his client was permitted to exchange the Roman scepter for the bishopric of Salona. After extinguishing such a competitor, the emperor Nepos was acknowledged by the Senate and the Italians and by the provincials of Gaul. His moral virtues and military talents were loudly celebrated, and those who derived any private benefit from his government announced, in prophetic strains, the restoration of the public felicity. Their hopes, if such hopes had been entertained, were confounded within the term of a single year, and the treaty of peace, which ceded Auvergne to the Visigoths, is the only event of his short and inglorious reign. The most faithful subjects of Gaul were sacrificed by the Italian emperor to the hopes of domestic security, but his repose was soon invaded by a furious sedition of the barbarian confederates, who, under the command of Orestes, their general, were in full march from Rome to Ravenna. Nepos trembled at their approach, and instead of placing a just confidence in the strength of Ravenna, 
he hastily escaped to his ships and retired to his Dalmatian principality on the opposite coast of the Hadriatic. By this shameful abdication, he protracted his life about five years in a very ambiguous state between an emperor and an exile, till he was assassinated at Salona by the ungrateful Glycarius, who was translated, perhaps as the reward of his crime, to the archbishopric of Milan. The nations who had asserted their independence after the death of Attila were established, by the right of possession or conquest, in the boundless countries to the north of the Danube, or in the Roman provinces between the river and the Alps. But the bravest of their youth enlisted in the army of confederates, who formed the defense and the terror of Italy. And in this curious multitude, the names of the Heruli, the Scyri, the Alani, the Tucurlingi, and the Rugians appear to have predominated. The example of these warriors was imitated by Orestes, the son of Tatulus, and the father of the last Roman emperor of the West. Orestes, who had already been mentioned in this history, had never deserted his country. His birth and fortunes rendered him one of the most illustrious subjects of Pannonia. When that province was ceded to the Huns, he entered into the service of Attila, his lawful sovereign, obtained the office of his secretary, and was repeatedly sent ambassador to Constantinople, to represent the person and signify the commands of the imperious monarch. The death of that conqueror restored him to his freedom, and Orestes might honorably refuse either to follow the sons of Attila into the Scythian desert, or to obey the Ostrogoths, who had usurped the dominion of Pannonia. He preferred the service of the Italian princes, the successors of Valentinian, and as he possessed the qualifications of courage, industry, and experience, he advanced with rapid steps in the military profession, till he was elevated, by the favor of Nepos himself, to the dignities of patrician and master general of the troops. These troops had been long accustomed to reverence the character and authority of Orestes, who affected their manners, conversed with them in their own language, and was intimately connected with their national chieftains by long habits of familiarity and friendship. At his solicitation they rose in arms against the obscure Greek who presumed to claim their obedience, and when Orestes, from some secret motive, declined the purple, they consented, with the same faculty, to acknowledge his son, Augustulus, as the emperor of the West. By the abdication of Nepos, Orestes had now obtained the summit of his ambitious hopes, but he soon discovered, before the end of the first year, that the lessons of perjury and ingratitude which a rebel must inculcate will be retorted against himself, and that the precarious sovereign of Italy was only permitted to choose whether he would be the slave or the victim of his barbarian mercenaries. The dangerous alliance of those strangers had oppressed and insulted the last remains of Roman freedom and dignity. At each revolution their pay and privileges were augmented, but their insolence increased in a still more extravagant degree. They envied the fortune of their brethren in Gaul, Spain, and Africa, whose victorious arms had acquired an independent and perpetual inheritance, and they insisted on their peremptory demand that a third part of the lands of Italy should be immediately divided among them. Orestes, with the spirit which, in another situation, might be entitled to our esteem, chose rather to encounter the rage of an armed multitude than to subscribe the ruin of an innocent people. He rejected the audacious demand, and his refusal was favorable to the ambition of Odoacer, a bold barbarian, who assured his fellow soldiers that, if they dared to associate under his command, they might soon extort the justice which had been denied to their dutiful petitions. From all the camps and garrisons of Italy, the confederates, actuated by the same resentment and the same hopes, impatiently flocked to the standard of this popular leader, and the unfortunate patrician, overwhelmed by the torrent, hastily retreated to the strong city of Pavia, the episcopal seat of the holy Epiphantes. Pavia was immediately besieged, the fortifications were stormed, the town was pillaged, and although the bishop might labor, with much zeal and some success, to save the property of the church and the chastity of the female captives, the tumult could only be appeased by the execution of Orestes. His brother Paul was slain in an action near Ravenna, and the helpless Augustulus, who could no longer command the respect, was reduced to implore the clemency of Indoecher. That successful barbarian was the son of Edicon, who, in some remarkable transactions, particularly described in a preceding chapter, had been the colleague of Orestes himself. 
the honor of an ambassador should be exempt from suspicion, and Edicon had listened to a conspiracy against the life of his sovereign. But this apparent guilt was expiated by his merit or repentance. His rank was eminent and conspicuous. He enjoyed the favor of Attila, and the troops under his command, who guarded in their turn the royal village, consisted of a tribe of the Skiri, his immediate and hereditary subjects. In the revolt of the nation, they still adhered to the Huns, and, more than twelve years afterwards, the name of Edicon is honorably mentioned in their unequal contest with the Ostrogoths, which was terminated after two bloody battles by the defeat and dispersion of the Skiri. Their gallant leader, who did not survive this national calamity, left two sons, Onulf and Odoacer, to struggle with adversity, and to maintain, as they might, by rapine or service, the faithful followers of their exile. Onulf directed his steps towards Constantinople, where he sullied, by the assassination of a generous benefactor, the fame which he had acquired in arms. His brother Odoacer had a wandering life among the barbarians of Noricum, with a mind and a fortune suited to the most desperate adventures, and when he fixed his choice, he piously visited the cell of Severinus, the popular saint of the country, to solicit his approbation and blessing. The lowness of the door would not admit the lofty stature of a doaker. He was obliged to stoop, but in that humble attitude the saint could discern the symptoms of his future greatness, and addressing him in a prophetic tone, Pursue, said he, your design. Proceed to Italy. You will soon cast away this coarse garment of skins, and your wealth will be adequate to the liberality of your mind. The barbarian, whose daring spirit accepted and ratified the petition, was admitted into the service of the Western Empire, and soon obtained an honorable rank in the guards. His manners were gradually polished, his military skill was improved, and the confederates of Italy would not have elected him for their general, unless the exploits of Odoacer had established a high opinion of his courage and capacity. Their military acclamations saluted him with the title of king, but he abstained during his whole reign from the use of the purple and diadem, lest he should offend those princes whose subjects, by their accidental mixture, had formed the victorious army which time and policy might insensibly unite into a great nation. Royalty was familiar to the barbarians, and the submissive people of Italy was prepared to obey, without a murmur, the authority which he should condescend to exercise as the vice-regent of the emperor of the West. But Odoacer had resolved to abolish that useless and expensive office, and such is the weight of antique prejudice, that it required some boldness and penetration to discover the extreme faculty of the enterprise. The unfortunate Augustulus was made the instrument of his own disgrace. He signified his resignation to the Senate, and that assembly, in their last act of obedience to a Roman prince, still affected the spirit of freedom and the forms of the Constitution. An epistle was addressed, by their unanimous decree, to the Emperor Zeno, the son-in-law and successor of Leo, who had lately been restored, after a short rebellion, to the Byzantine throne. They solemnly disclaim the necessity, or even the wish, of continuing any longer the imperial secession in Italy, since, in their opinion, the majesty of a sole monarch is sufficient to pervade and protect, at the same time, both the East and West. In their own name, and in the name of the people, they consent that the seat of universal empire shall be transferred from Rome to Constantinople, and they basely renounce the right of choosing their master, the only vestige that yet remained of the authority which had given laws to the world. The Republic, they repeat that name without a blush, might safely confide in the civil and military virtues of Odoacer, and they humbly request that the Emperor would invest him with the title of Patrician, and the administration of the Diocese of Italy. The deputies of the Senate were received at Constantinople with some marks of displeasure and indignation, and when they were admitted to the audience of Zeno, he sternly reproached them with their treatment of the two emperors, Anthemius and Nepos, whom the East had successively granted to the prayers of Italy. The first, continued he, you have murdered, the second you have expelled, but the second is still alive, and whilst he lives, he is your lawful sovereign." But the prudent Zeno soon deserted the hopeless cause of his abdicated colleague. His vanity was gratified by the title of sole emperor, and by the statues erected to his honor in the several quarters of Rome. 
he entertained a friendly though ambiguous correspondent with the patrician Odoacer, and he gratefully accepted the imperial ensigns, the sacred ornaments of the throne and palace, which the barbarian was not unwilling to remove from the sight of the people. In the space of twenty years since the death of Valentinian, nine emperors had successively disappeared, and the son of Orestes, a youth recommended only by his beauty, would be the least entitled to the notice of posterity, if his reign, which was marked by the extinction of the Roman Empire in the West, did not leave a memorable era in the history of mankind. The patrician Orestes had married the daughter of Count Romulus of Petovio in Noricum. The name of Augustus, notwithstanding the jealousy of power, was known at Aquileia as a familiar surname, and the appellations of the two great founders of the city and of the monarchy were thus strangely united in the last of their successors. The son of Orestes assumed and disgraced the names of Romulus Augustus, but the first was corrupted into Momulus by the Greeks, and the second has been changed by the Latins into the contemptible diminutive Augustulus. The life of this inoffensive youth was spared by the generous clemency of Odoacer, who dismissed him with his whole family from the imperial palace, fixed his annual allowance at six thousand pieces of gold, and assigned the castle of Lucullus in Campania for the place of his exile or retirement. As soon as the Romans breathed from the toils of the Punic War, they were attracted by the beauties and the pleasures of Campania, and the country house of the elder Scipio and Laternium exhibited a lasting model of their rustic simplicity. The delicious shores of the Bay of Naples was crowded with villas, and Scylla applauded the masterly skill of his rival, who had seated himself on the lofty promontory of Misenum, that commands on every side the sea and land, as far as the boundaries of the horizon. The villa of Marius was purchased within a few years by Lucullus, and the price had increased from two thousand five hundred to more than fourscore thousand pounds sterling. It was adorned by the new proprietor with Grecian arts and Asiatic treasures, and the houses and gardens of Lucullus obtained a distinguished rank in the list of imperial palaces. When the Vandals became formidable to the seacoast, the Lucullan villa on the promontory of Mycenaeum gradually assumed the strength and appellation of a strong castle, the obscure retreat of the last emperor of the West. About twenty years after that great revolution, it was converted into a church and monastery to receive the bones of St. Severinus. They secretly reposed, amidst the broken trophies of Kimbric and Armenian victories, till the beginning of the tenth century, when the fortifications which might afford a dangerous shelter to the Saracens were demolished by the people of Naples. Odoacer was the first barbarian who reigned in Italy, over a people who had once asserted their just superiority above the rest of mankind. The disgrace of the Romans still excites our respectful compassion, and we fondly sympathize with the imaginary grief and indignation of their degenerate posterity. But the calamities of Italy had gradually subdued the proud consciousness of freedom and glory. In the age of Roman virtue, the provinces were subject to the arms, and the citizens to the laws of the Republic, till those laws were subverted by civil discord, and both the city and the provinces became the servile property of a tyrant. The forms of the Constitution, which alleviated or disguised their abject slavery, were abolished by time and violence. The Italians alternately lamented the presence or the absence of the sovereigns whom they detested or despised, and the succession of five centuries inflicted the various evils of military license, capricious despotism, and elaborate oppression. During the same period, the barbarians had emerged from obscurity and contempt, and the warriors of Germany and Scythia were introduced into the provinces as the servants, the allies, and at length the masters of the Romans, whom they insulted or protected. The hatred of the people was suppressed by fear. They respected the spirit and splendor of the martial chiefs, who were invested with the honors of the empire, and the fate of Rome had long depended on the sword of those formidable strangers. The stern Ricimer, who trampled on the ruins of Italy, had exercised the power without assuming the title of a king, and the patient Romans were insensibly prepared to acknowledge the royalty of Odoacer and his barbaric successors. The king of Italy was not unworthy of the high station to which his valor and fortune had exalted him. 
his savage manners were polished by the habits of conversation, and he respected, though a conqueror and a barbarian, the institutions and even the prejudices of his subjects. After an interval of seven years, Odoacer restored the consulship of the West. For himself, he modestly or proudly declined an honor, which was still accepted by the emperors of the East. But the curial chair was successfully filled by eleven of the most illustrious senators, and the list is adorned by the respectful name of Basilus, whose virtues claim the friendship and the grateful applause of Sidonius, his client. The laws of the emperors were strictly enforced, and the civil administration of Italy was still exercised by the praetorian prefect and his subordinate officers. Odoacer devolved on the Roman magistrates the odious and oppressive task of collecting the public revenue, but he reserved for himself the merit of seasonable and popular indulgence. Like the rest of the barbarians, he had been instructed in the Arian heresy, but he revered the monastic and episcopal characters, and the silence of the Catholics attest the toleration which they enjoyed. The peace of the city required the interposition of his prefect Basilus in the choice of a Roman pontiff. The decree which restrained the clergy from alienating their lands was ultimately designed for the benefit of the people, whose devotion would have been taxed to repair the dilapidations of the church. Italy was protected by the arms of its conqueror, and its frontiers were respected by the barbarians of Gaul and Germany, who had so long insulted the feeble race of Theodosius. Odoacer passed the Hadriatic to chastise the assassins of the Emperor Nepos, and to acquire the maritime province of Dalmatia. He passed the Alps to rescue the remains of Noricum from Fava, or Philetius, king of the Rugians, who had held his residence beyond the Danube. The king was vanquished in battle, and led away a prisoner. A numerous colony of captives and subjects were transplanted into Italy. In Rome, after a long period of defeat and disgrace, might claim the triumph of her barbarian master. Notwithstanding the prudence and success of Odoacer, his kingdom exhibited the sad prospect of misery and desolation. Since the age of Tiberius, the decay of agriculture had been felt in Italy, and it was a just subject of complaint that the life of the Roman people depended on the accidents of the winds and waves. In the division and the decline of the empire, the tributary harvests of Egypt and Africa were withdrawn. The numbers of the inhabitants continually diminished with the means of subsistence, and the country was exhausted by the irretrievable losses of war, famine, and pestilence. St. Ambrose had deplored the ruin of a populous district, which had once adorned with the flourishing cities of Bologna, Modena, Regium, and Placentia. Pope Galasius was a subject of Odoacer, and he affirms, with strong exaggeration, that in Emilia, Tuscany, and the adjacent provinces, the human species was almost extirpated. The plebeians of Rome, who were fed by the hand of their master, perished or disappeared as soon as his liberality was suppressed. The decline of the arts reduced the industrious mechanics to idleness and want, and the senators, who might support with patience the ruin of their country, bewailed their private loss of wealth and luxury. One-third of those ample estates, to which the ruin of Italy is originally imputed, was extorted for the use of the conquerors. Injuries were aggravated by insults. The sense of actual sufferings was embittered by the fear of more dreadful evils. And as new lands were allotted to new swarms of barbarians, each senator was apprehensive lest the arbitrary surveyors should approach his favorite villa or his most profitable farm. The least unfortunate were those who submitted without a murmur to the power which it was impossible to resist. Since they desired to live, they owed some gratitude to the tyrant who had spared their lives, and since he was the absolute master of their fortunes, the portion which he left must be accepted as his pure and voluntary gift. The distress of Italy was mitigated by the prudence and humanity of Odoacer, who had bound himself, as the price of his elevation, to satisfy the demands of a licentious and turbulent multitude. The kings of the barbarians were frequently resisted, deposed, or murdered by their native subjects, and the various bands of Italian mercenaries, who associated, under the banner of an elective general, claimed a larger privilege of freedom and rapine. A monarchy destitute of national union and hereditary right hastened to its dissolution. After a reign of fourteen years, Odoacer was oppressed 
by the superior genius of Theodoric, king of the Ostrogoths, a hero alike excellent in the arts of war and of government, who restored an age of peace and prosperity, and whose name still excites and deserves the attention of mankind. End of chapter 36, part 5《Part I of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon. Volume Three, Chapter 37 Conversion of the Barbarians to Christianity. Part I origin, progress, and effects of the monastic life, conversion of the barbarians to Christianity and Arianism, persecution of the Vandals in Africa, extinction of Arianism among the barbarians. The indissoluble connection of civil and ecclesiastical affairs has compelled and encouraged me to relate the progress, the persecutions, the establishment, the divisions, the final triumph, and the gradual corruption of Christianity. I have purposely delayed the consideration of two religious events, interesting in the study of human nature, and important in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. First, the institution of the monastic life, and second, the conversion of the northern barbarians. Prosperity and peace introduced the distinction of the vulgar and the ascetic Christians. The loose and imperfect practice of religion satisfied the conscience of the multitude. The prince or magistrate, the soldier or merchant, reconciled their fervent zeal and implicit faith with the exercise of their profession, the pursuit of their interest, and the indulgence of their passion. But the ascetics, who obeyed and abused the rigid precepts of the gospel, were inspired by the savage enthusiasm which represents man as a criminal, and God as a tyrant. They seriously renounced the business and the pleasures of the age, abjured the use of wine, flesh, and marriage, chastised their body, mortified their affections, and embraced a life of misery as the price of eternal happiness. In the reign of Constantine, the ascetics fled from a profane and degenerate world to perpetual solitude, or religious society. Like the first Christians of Jerusalem, they resigned the use or property of their temporal possessions, established regular communities of the same sex, and a similar disposition, and assumed the name of hermits, monks, and anchorites, expressive of their lonely retreat in a natural or artificial desert. They soon acquired the respect of the world which they despised, and the loudest applause was bestowed on this divine philosophy which surpassed, without the aid of science or reason, the laborious virtues of the Grecian schools. The monks might indeed contend with the Stoics in contempt of fortune, pain, and death. The Pythagorean silence and submission were revived in their servile discipline, and they disdained, as firmly as the cynics themselves, all the forms and decencies of civil society. But the votaries of this divine philosophy aspired to imitate a purer and more perfect model. They trod in the footsteps of the prophets, who had retired to the desert, and they restored the devout and contemplative life, which had been instituted by the Essenians in Palestine and Egypt. The philosophic eye of Pliny had surveyed with astonishment a solitary people, who dwelt among the palm-trees near the Dead Sea, who subsisted without money, who were propagated without women, and who derived from the disgust and repentance of mankind a perpetual supply of voluntary associates. Egypt the fruitful parent of superstition, afforded the first example of monastic life. Antony, an illiterate youth of the lower parts of Thebes, distributed his patrimony, deserted his family and native home, and executed his monastic penance with original and intrepid fanaticism. After a long and painful novitiate, among the tombs and in a ruined tower, he boldly advanced into the desert three days' journey to the eastward of the Nile, discovered a lonely spot which possessed the advantages of shade and water, and fixed his last residence on Mount Colzim, near the Red Sea, where an ancient monastery still preserves the name and memory of the saint. The curious devotion of the Christians pursued him to the desert, and when he was obliged to appear at Alexandria, in the face of mankind he supported his fame with discretion and dignity. He enjoyed the friendship of Athanasius, whose doctrine he approved, and the Egyptian peasant respectfully declined a respectful invitation from the Emperor Constantine. 
The venerable patriarch, for Antony attained the age of one hundred and five years, beheld the numerous progeny which had been formed by his example and his lessons. The prolific colonies of monks multiplied with rapid increase on the sands of Libya, upon the rocks of Thebes, and in the cities of the Nile. To the south of Alexandria, the mountain and adjacent desert of Nitria were peopled by five thousand anchorets, and the, and the traveller may still investigate the ruins of fifty monasteries, which were planted in that barren soil by the disciples of Antony. In the upper Thebes, the vacant island of Taben was occupied by Pacomius and fourteen hundred of his brethren. That holy abbot successively founded nine monasteries of men and one of women, and the festival of Easter sometimes collected fifty thousand religious persons who followed his angelic rule of discipline. The stately and populous city of Oxyrhynchus, the seat of Christian orthodoxy, had devoted the temples, the public edifices, and even the ramparts to pious and charitable uses, and the bishop, who might preach in twelve churches, computed ten thousand females and twenty thousand males of the monastic profession. The Egyptians, who gloried in this marvellous revolution, were disposed to hope and to believe that the number of monks was equal to the remainder of the people, and posterity might repeat the saying, which had been formerly applied to the sacred animals of the same country, that in Egypt it was less difficult to find a god than a man. Athanasius introduced into Rome the knowledge and practice of the monastic life, and a school of this new philosophy was opened by the disciples of Antony, who accompanied their primate to the holy threshold of the Vatican. The strange and savage appearance of these Egyptians excited at first horror and contempt, and at length applause and zealous imitation. The senators, and more especially the matrons, transformed their palaces and villas into religious houses, and the narrow institution of six vestals was eclipsed by the frequent monasteries, which were seated on the ruins of ancient temples, and in the midst of the Roman Forum. Inflamed by the example of Antony, a Syrian youth, whose name was Hilarion, fixed his dreary abode on a sandy beach, between the sea and Amoris, about seven miles from Gaza. The austere penance in which he persisted forty-eight years diffused a similar enthusiasm, and the holy man was followed by a train of two or three thousand anchorites, whenever he visited the innumerable monasteries of Palestine. The fame of Basil is immortal in the monastic history of the East. With a mind that had tasted the learning and eloquence of Athens, with an ambition scarcely to be satisfied with the archbishopric of Caesarea, Basil retired to a savage solitude in Pontus, and deigned for a while to give laws to the spiritual colonies which he profusely scattered along the coast of the Black Sea. In the west, Martin of Tours, a soldier, a hermit, a bishop, and a saint, established the monasteries of Gaul. Two thousand of his disciples followed him to the grave, and his eloquent historian challenges the deserts of Thebes to produce, in a more favorable climate, a champion of equal virtue. The progress of the monks was not less rapid or universal than that of Christianity itself. Every province, and at last every city of the empire, was filled with their increasing multitudes, and the bleak and barren isles from Lorenz to Lepari, that rose out of the Tuscan sea, were chosen by the anchorites for the place of their voluntary exile. An easy and perpetual intercourse by sea and land connected the provinces of the Roman world, and the life of Hilarion displays the facility with which an indigent hermit of Palestine might traverse Egypt, embark for Sicily, escape to Epirus, and finally settle in the island of Cyprus. The Latin Christians embraced the religious institutions of Rome. The pilgrims who visited Jerusalem eagerly copied, in the most distant climates of the earth, the faithful model of the monastic life. The disciples of Antony spread themselves beyond the tropic, over the Christian empire of Ethiopia. The monastery of Bancor in Flintshire, which contained above two thousand brethren, dispersed a numerous colony among the barbarians of Ireland, and Iona, one of the Hebrides, which was planted by the Irish monks, diffused over the northern regions a doubtful ray of science and superstition. These unhappy exiles from social life were impelled by the dark and implacable genius of superstition. Their mutual resolution was supported by the example of millions of either sex, of every age, and of every rank, and each proselyte who entered the gates of a monastery was persuaded that he trod the steep and thorny path of eternal happiness. 
but the operation of these religious motives was variously determined by the temper and situation of mankind. Reason might subdue or passion suspend their influence, but they acted most forcibly on the infirm minds of children and females. They were strengthened by secret remorse or accidental misfortune, and they might derive some aid from the temporal considerations of vanity or interest. It was naturally supposed that the pious and humble monks, who had renounced the world to accomplish the work of their salvation, were the best qualified for the spiritual government of the Christians. The reluctant hermit was torn from his cell, and seated amidst the acclamations of the people, on the episcopal throne, the monasteries of Egypt, Gaul, and the East, supplied a regular succession of saints and bishops, and ambition soon discovered the secret road which led to the possession of wealth and honor. The popular monks, whose reputation was connected with the fame and success of the order, assiduously labored to multiply the number of their fellow captives. They insinuated themselves into noble and opulent families, and the specious arts of flattery and seduction were employed to secure those proselytes who might bestow wealth or dignity on the monastic profession. The indignant father bewailed the loss, perhaps, of an only son. The credulous maid was betrayed by vanity to violate the laws of nature, and the matron aspired to imaginary perfection by renouncing the virtues of domestic life. Paula yielded to the persuasive eloquence of Jerome, and the profane title of mother-in-law of God tempted that illustrious widow to consecrate the virginity of her daughter Eustochium. By the advice and in the company of her spiritual guide, Paula abandoned Rome and her infant son, retired to the holy village of Bethlehem, founded a hospital in four monasteries, and acquired, by her alms and penance, an eminent and conspicuous station in the Catholic Church. Such rare and illustrious penitents were celebrated as the glory and example of their age, but the monasteries were filled by a crowd of obscure and abject plebeians, who gained in the cloister much more than they had sacrificed in the world. Peasant slaves and mechanics might escape from poverty and contempt to a safe and honorable profession, whose apparent hardships are mitigated by custom, by popular applause, and by the secret relaxation of discipline. The subjects of Rome, whose persons and fortunes were made responsible for unequal and exorbitant tributes, retired from the oppression of the imperial government, and the pusillanimous youth preferred the penance of a monastic to the dangers of a military life. The affrighted provincials of every rank who fled before barbarians found shelter and subsistence. Whole legions were buried in these religious sanctuaries, and the same cause which relieved the distress of individuals impaired the strength and fortitude of the empire. The monastic profession of the ancients was an act of voluntary devotion. The inconstant fanatic was threatened with the eternal vengeance of the god whom he deserted, but the doors of the monastery were still open for repentance. Those monks whose conscience was fortified by reason or passion were at liberty to resume the character of men and citizens, and even the spouses of Christ might accept the legal embraces of an earthly lover. The examples of scandal and the progress of superstition suggested the propriety of more forcible restraints. After a sufficient trial, the fidelity of the novice was secured by a solemn and perpetual vow, and his irrevocable engagement was ratified by the laws of church and state. A guilty fugitive was pursued, arrested, and restored to his perpetual prison, and the interposition of the magistrate oppressed the freedom and the merit, which had alleviated in some degree the abject slavery of the monastic discipline. The actions of a monk, his words and even his thoughts, were determined by an inflexible rule, or a capricious superior. The slightest offences were corrected by disgrace or confinement, extraordinary fasts or bloody flagellation, and disobedience, murmur or delay were ranked in the catalogue of the most heinous sins. Blind submission to the commands of the abbot, however absurd or criminal they might seem, was the ruling principle, the first virtue of the Egyptian monks, and their patience was frequently exercised by the most extravagant trials. They were directed to remove an enormous walk assiduously to water a barren staff that was planted in the ground till at the end of three years it should vegetate and blossom like a tree to walk into a fiery furnace or to cast their infant into a deep pond and several saints or madmen have been immortalized in monastic story by their thoughtless and fearless obedience the freedom of the mind the source of every generous and rational sentiment was destroyed by the habits of credulity and submission and the monk contracting the vices of a slave, devoutly followed the faith and passion of his ecclesiastical tyrant. 
the peace of the Eastern Church was invaded by a swarm of fanatics, incapable of fear or reason or humanity, and the imperial troops acknowledged without shame that they were much less apprehensive of an encounter with the fiercest barbarians. Superstition has often framed and consecrated the fantastic garments of the monks, but their apparent singularity sometimes proceeds from their uniform attachment to a simple primitive model which the revolutions of fashion have made ridiculous in the eyes of mankind. The father of the Benedictines expressly disclaims all idea of choice and merit, and soberly exhorts his disciples to adopt the coarse and convenient dress of the countries which they may inhabit. The monastic habits of the ancients varied with the climate, and their mode of life, and they assumed with the same indifference the sheepskin of the Egyptian peasants or the cloak of Grecian philosophers. They allowed themselves the use of linen in Egypt, where it was a cheap and domestic manufacture, but in the West they rejected such as an expensive article of foreign luxury. It was the practice of the monks either to cut or shave their hair. They wrapped their heads in a cowl to escape the sight of profane objects. Their legs and feet were naked, except in extreme cold of winter, and their slow and feeble steps were supported by a long staff. The aspect of a genuine anchoret was horrid and disgusting. Every sensation that is offensive to man was thought acceptable to God, and the angelic rule of Tibet condemned the salutary custom of bathing the limbs in water, and of anointing them with oil. The austere monks slept on the ground, on a hard mat, or a rough blanket, and the same bundle of palm leaves served them, as a seat in the day and a pillow in the night. Their original cells were low, narrow huts, built of the slightest materials which formed, by the regular distribution of the streets, a large and populous village, enclosing within the common wall a church, a hospital, perhaps a library, some necessary offices, a garden, and a fountain or reservoir of fresh water. Thirty or forty brethren composed a family of separate discipline and diet, and the great monasteries of Egypt consisted of thirty or forty families. End of chapter 37 Part 1Part two of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirsten Ferreri. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon, Volume Three, Chapter Thirty Seven Conversion of the Barbarians to Christianity, Part Two. Pleasure and guilt are synonymous terms in the language of the monks, and they discovered by experience that rigid fasts and abstemious diet are the most effectual preservatives against the impure desires of the flesh. The rules of abstinence which they imposed or practiced were not uniform or perpetual. The cheerful festival of the Pentecost was balanced by the extraordinary mortification of Lent. The fervor of new monasteries was insensibly relaxed, and the voracious appetite of the Gauls could not imitate the patient and temperate virtue of the Egyptians. The disciples of Antony and Pacomius were satisfied with their daily pittance, of twelve ounces of bread, or rather biscuit, which they divided into two frugal repasts of the afternoon and of the evening. It was esteemed a merit, and almost a duty, to abstain from the boiled vegetables which were provided for the refectory but the extraordinary bounty of the abbot sometimes indulged them with the luxury of cheese, fruit salad, and the small dried fish of the Nile. A more ample latitude of sea and river fish was gradually allowed or assumed, but the use of flesh was long confined to the sick, or travellers, and when it gradually prevailed in the less rigid monasteries of Europe, a singular distinction was introduced, as if birds, whether wild or domestic, had been less profane than the grosser animals of the field. Water was the pure and innocent beverage of the primitive monks, and the founder of the Benedictines regrets the daily portion of half a pint of wine which had been extorted from him by the intemperance of the age. Such an allowance might easily be supplied by the vineyards of Italy, and his victorious disciples, who passed the Alps, the Rhine, and the Baltic, required in place of wine an adequate compensation of strong beer or cider. The candidate who aspired to the virtue of evangelical poverty abjured at his first entrance into a regular community the idea, and even the name, of all separate or exclusive possessions. The brethren were supported by their manual labor, and the duty of labor was strenuously recommended as a penance, as an exercise, and as the most laudable means of securing their daily subsistence. The garden and fields, which the industry of the monks had often rescued from the forest or the morass, were diligently cultivated by their hands. 
They performed without reluctance the menial offices of slaves and domestics, and the several trades that were necessary to provide their habits, their utensils, and their lodging were exercised within the precincts of the great monasteries. The monastic studies have tended for the most part to darken rather than to dispel the cloud of superstition. Yet the curiosity or zeal of some learned solitaries has cultivated the ecclesiastical and even the profane sciences, and posterity must gratefully acknowledge that the monuments of Greek and Roman literature have been preserved and multiplied by their indefatigable pens. The more humble industry of the monks, especially in Egypt, was contented with the silent, sedentary occupation of making wooden sandals, or of twisting the leaves of the palm-tree into mats and blankets. The superfluous stock, which was not consumed in domestic use, supplied by trade the wants of the community. The boats of Taban, and the other monasteries of Thebais, descended the Nile as far as Alexandria, and in a Christian market the sanctity of the workmen might enhance the intrinsic value of the work. But the necessity of manual labor was insensibly superseded. The novice was tempted to bestow his fortune on the saints, in whose society he was resolved to spend the remainder of his life, and the pernicious indulgence of the laws permitted him to receive for their use any future accessions of legacy or inheritance. Melania contributed her plate, three hundred pounds weight of silver, and Paula contracted an immense debt for the relief of their favorite monks, who kindly imparted the merits of their prayers and penance to a rich and liberal sinner. Time continually increased, and accidents could seldom diminish the estates of the popular monasteries, which spread over the adjacent country and cities, and in the first century of their institution the infidel Zosimus had maliciously observed that, for the benefit of the poor, the Christian monks had reduced a great part of mankind to a state of beggary. As long as they maintained their original fervor, they approved themselves, however, the faithful and benevolent stewards of the charity which was entrusted to their care but their discipline was corrupted by prosperity. They gradually assumed the pride of wealth, and at last indulged the luxury of expense. Their public luxury might be excused by the magnificence of religious worship, and the decent motive of erecting durable habitations for an immortal society. But every age of the Church has accused the licentiousness of the degenerate monks, who no longer remembered the object of their institution, embraced the vain and sensual pleasures of the world which they had renounced, and scandalously abused the riches which had been acquired by the austere virtues of their founders. Their natural descent, from such painful and dangerous virtue to the common vices of humanity, will not, perhaps, excite much grief or indignation in the mind of a philosopher." The lives of the primitive monks were consumed in penance and solitude, undisturbed by the various occupations which fill the time, and exercise the faculties of reasonable, active, and social beings. Whenever they were permitted to step beyond the precincts of the monastery, two jealous companions were the mutual guards and spies of each other's actions, and after their return they were condemned to forget, or at least to suppress, whatever they had seen and heard in the world. Strangers who professed the orthodox faith were hospitably entertained in a separate apartment, but their dangerous conversation was restricted to some chosen elders of approved discretion and fidelity. Except in their presence the monastic slave might not receive the visits of his friends or kindred, and it was deemed highly meritorious if he afflicted a tender sister or an aged parent by the obstinate refusal of a word or look. The monks themselves passed their lives without personal attachments, among a crowd which had been formed by accident, and was detained in the same prison by force or prejudice. Recluse fanatics have few ideas or sentiments to communicate. A special license of the abbot regulated the time and duration of their familiar visits, and at their silent meals they were enveloped in their cowls, inaccessible and almost invisible to each other. Study is the resource of solitude, but education had not prepared and qualified for any liberal studies the mechanics and peasants who filled the monastic communities. They might work— but the vanity of spiritual perfection was tempted to disdain the exercise of manual labor, and the industry must be faint and languid which is not excited by the sense of personal interest. According to their faith and zeal, they might employ the day, which they passed in their cells, either in vocal or mental prayer. They assembled in the evening, and they were awakened in the night for the public worship of the monastery. The precise moment was determined by the stars, which are seldom clouded in the serene sky of Egypt, and a rustic horn or trumpet, the signal of devotion, twice interrupted the vast silence of the desert. Even sleep, the last refuge of the unhappy, was rigorously measured. The vacant hours of the monk heavily rolled along without business or pleasure, and before the close of each day he had repeatedly accused the tedious progress of the sun. In this comfortless state superstition still pursued and tormented her wretched votaries. 
The repose which they had sought in the cloister was disturbed by a tardy repentance, profane doubts, and guilty desires, and while they considered each natural impulse as an unpardonable sin, they perpetually trembled on the edge of a flaming and bottomless abyss. From the painful struggles of disease and despair, these unhappy victims were sometimes relieved by madness or death, and in the sixth century a hospital was founded at Jerusalem for a small portion of the austere penitents who were deprived of their senses. Their visions, before they attained this extreme and acknowledged term of frenzy, have afforded ample materials of supernatural history. It was their firm persuasion that the air which they breathed was peopled with invisible enemies, with innumerable demons who watched every occasion and assumed every form to terrify, and above all to tempt, their unguarded virtue. The imagination and even the senses were deceived by the illusions of distempered fanaticism, and the hermit, whose midnight prayer was oppressed by involuntary slumber, might easily confound the phantoms of horror or delight which had occupied his sleeping and his waking dreams. The monks were divided into two classes, the Knobites, who lived under a common and regular discipline, and the Anachorets, who indulged their unsocial, independent fanaticism. The most devout or the most ambitious of the spiritual brethren renounced the convent, as they had renounced the world. The fervent monasteries of Egypt, Palestine, and Syria were surrounded by a lora, a distinct circle of solitary cells, and the extravagant penance of hermits was stimulated by applause and emulation. They sunk under the painful weight of crosses and chains, and their emaciated limbs were confined by collars, bracelets, gauntlets, and greaves of massy and rigid iron. All superfluous encumbrance of dress they contemptuously cast away, and some savage saints of both sexes have been admired whose naked bodies were only covered by their long hair. They aspired to reduce themselves to the rude and miserable state in which the human brute is scarcely distinguishable above his kindred animals, and the numerous sect of Anachorets derived their name from their humble practice of grazing in the fields of Mesopotamia with the common herd. They often usurped the den of some wild beast whom they affected to resemble. They buried themselves in some gloomy cavern which art or nature had scooped out of the rock, and the marble quarries of Thebaeus are still inscribed with the monuments of their penance. The most perfect hermits are supposed to have passed many days without food, many nights without sleep, and many years without speaking. And glorious was the man, I abuse that name, who contrived any cell or seat of a peculiar construction which might expose him in the most inconvenient posture to the inclemency of the seasons. Among these heroes of the monastic life, the name and genius of Simeon Stylites have been immortalized by the singular invention of an aerial penance. At the age of thirteen, the young Syrian deserted the profession of a shepherd and threw himself into an austere monastery. After a long and painful novitiate, in which Simeon was repeatedly saved from pious suicide, he established his residence on a mountain, about thirty or forty miles to the east of Antioch. Within the space of a mandra, or circle of stones, to which he had attached himself by a ponderous chain, he ascended a column, which was successively raised from the height of nine to that of sixty feet from the ground. In this last and lofty station, the Syrian Anachoret resisted the heat of thirty summers, and the cold of as many winters. Habit and exercise instructed him to maintain his dangerous situation without fear or giddiness, and successively to assume the different postures of devotion. He sometimes prayed in an erect attitude, with his outstretched arms in the figure of a cross, but his most familiar practice was that of bending his meagre skeleton from the forehead to the feet and a curious spectator, after numbering twelve hundred and forty-four repetitions, at length desisted from the endless account. The progress of an ulcer in his thigh might shorten, but it could not disturb the celestial life, and the patient hermit expired without descending from his column. A prince who should capriciously inflict such tortures would be deemed a tyrant, but it would surpass the power of a tyrant to impose a long and miserable existence on the reluctant victims of his cruelty. This voluntary martyrdom must have gradually destroyed the sensibility both of mind and body, nor can it be presumed that the fanatics who torment themselves are susceptible of any lively affection for the rest of mankind. A cruel, unfeeling temper has distinguished the monks of every age and country. Their stern indifference, which is seldom mollified by personal friendship, is inflamed by religious hatred, and their merciless zeal has strenuously administered the holy office of the Inquisition. The monastic saints, who excite only the contempt and pity of a philosopher, were respected, and almost adored by the prince and people. 
successive crowds of pilgrims from Gaul and India saluted the divine pillar of Simeon. The tribes of Saracens disputed in arms the honor of his benediction. The queens of Arabia and Persia gratefully confessed his supernatural virtue, and the angelic hermit was consulted by the younger Theodosius in the most important concerns of the church and state. His remains were transported from the mountain of Telenissa by a solemn procession of the patriarch, the master-general of the East, six bishops, twenty-one counts or tribunes, and six thousand soldiers. And Antioch revered his bones as her glorious ornament and impregnable defense. The fame of the apostles and martyrs was gradually eclipsed by those recent and popular anachorets. The Christian world fell prostrate before their shrines, and the miracles ascribed to their relics exceeded, at least in number and duration, the spiritual exploits of their lives. But the golden legend of their lives was embellished by the artful credulity of their interested brethren, and a believing age was easily persuaded that the slightest caprice of an Egyptian or a Syrian monk had been sufficient to interrupt the eternal laws of the universe. The favorites of heaven were accustomed to cure inveterate diseases with a touch, a word, or a distant message, and to expel the most obstinate demons from the souls or bodies which they possessed. They familiarly accosted, imperiously commanded, the lions and serpents of the desert, infused vegetation into a sapless trunk, suspended iron on the surface of the water, passed the Nile on the back of a crocodile, and refreshed themselves in a fiery furnace. These extravagant tales, which display the fiction without the genius of poetry, have seriously affected the reason, the faith, and the morals of Christians. Their credulity debased and vitiated the faculties of the mind. They corrupted the evidence of history, and superstition gradually extinguished the hostile light of philosophy and science. Every mode of religious worship which had been practiced by the saints, every mysterious doctrine which they believed, was fortified by the sanction of divine revelation, and all the manly virtues were oppressed by the servile and pusillanimous reign of the monks. If it be possible to measure the interval between the philosophic writings of Cicero and the sacred legend of Theodoret, between the character of Cato and that of Simeon, we appreciate the memorable revolution which was accomplished in the Roman Empire within a period of five hundred years. The progress of Christianity has been marked by two glorious and decisive victories, over the learned and luxurious citizens of the Roman Empire, and over the warlike barbarians of Scythia and Germany, who subverted the empire and embraced the religion of the Romans. The Goths were the foremost of these savage proselytes, and the nation was indebted for its conversion to a countryman, or at least to a subject worthy to be ranked among the inventors of useful arts, who have deserved the remembrance and gratitude of posterity. A great number of Roman provincials had been led into captivity by the Gothic bands, who ravaged Asia in the time of Gallienus, and of these captives many were Christians, and several belonged to the ecclesiastical order. These involuntary missionaries, dispersed as slaves in the villages of Decia, successively labored for the salvation of their masters. The seeds which they planted of the evangelic doctrine were gradually propagated, and before the end of a century the pious work was achieved by the labors of Ulphilus, whose ancestors had been transported beyond the Danube for a small town of Cappadocia. Ulphilus, the bishop and apostle of the Goths, acquired their love and reverence by his blameless life and indefatigable zeal, and they received, with implicit confidence, the doctrines of truth and virtue which he preached and practiced. He executed the arduous task of translating the scriptures into their native tongue, a dialect of the German or Teutonic language, but he prudently suppressed the four books of kings, as they might tend to irritate the fierce and sanguinary spirit of the barbarians. The rude, imperfect idiom of soldiers and shepherds so ill-qualified to communicate any spiritual ideas was improved and modulated by his genius and Ulphilus, before he could frame his version, was obliged to compose a new alphabet of twenty-four letters, four of which he invented, to express the peculiar sounds that were unknown to the Greek and Latin pronunciation. But the prosperous state of the Gothic church was soon afflicted by war and intestine discord, and the chieftains were divided by religion as well as by interest. Fritern, the friend of the Romans, became the proselyte of Ulphilus, while the haughty soul of Athenaric disdained the yoke of the empire and of the gospel. The faith of the new converts was trapped by the persecution which he excited. A wagon, bearing aloft the shapeless image of Thor, perhaps, or of Woden, was conducted in solemn procession through the streets of the camp. And the rebels, who refused to worship the god of their fathers, were immediately burnt, with their tents and families. The character of Ulphilus recommended him to the esteem of the eastern court, where he twice appeared as a minister of peace. 
he pleaded the case of the distressed Goths, who implored the protection of Valens, and the name of Moses was applied to this spiritual guide who conducted his people through the deep waters of the Danube to the land of promise. The devout shepherds, who were attached to his person and tractable to his voice, acquiesced in their settlement, at the foot of the Macian mountains, in a country of woodlands and pastures, which supported their flocks and herds, and enabled them to purchase the corn and wine of the more plentiful provinces. These harmless barbarians multiplied in obscure peace and the profession of Christianity. Their fiercer brethren, the formidable Visigoths, universally adopted the religion of the Romans, with whom they maintained a perpetual intercourse of war, of friendship, or of conquest. In their long and victorious march from the Danube to the Atlantic Ocean, they converted their allies, they educated the rising generation, and the devotion which reigned in the camp of Alaric or the court of Thelos might edify or disgrace the palaces of Rome and Constantinople. During the same period Christianity was embraced by almost all the barbarians, who established their kingdoms on the ruins of the Western Empire, the Burgundians in Gaul, the Suevi in Spain, the Vandals in Africa, and the Ostrogoths in Pannonia, and the various bands of mercenaries that raised Oedacer to the throne of Italy. The Franks and the Saxons still persevered in the errors of paganism, but the Franks obtained the monarchy of Gaul by their submission to the example of Clovis, and the Saxon conquerors of Britain were reclaimed from their savage superstition by the missionaries of Rome. These barbarian proselytes displayed an ardent and successful zeal in the propagation of the faith. The Merovingian kings and their successors, Charlemagne and the Othos, extended by their laws and victories the dominion of the cross. England produced the apostle of Germany, and the evangelic light was gradually diffused from the neighborhood of the Rhine to the nations of the Elbe, the Vistula, and the Baltic. End of chapter 37, part 2